In part three, you will learn how to sketch a graph with sharp turns in it. So here we have to use the guidelines for graphing to sketch the graph of f of x equals the quantity x squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds power. First up, we need to look at the domain. And remember that having a quantity raised to the 2 thirds power, another way of writing that is that it is the cube root of the quantity x squared minus 4 squared. Now because the root is odd, that means it's okay for the argument to be negative, zero, or positive. So there are no restrictions on this domain, so our domain is all real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity. Next up, we need to get the intercepts, and the x-intercept is found by solving f of x equals zero, so we will take x squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds power and set it equal to zero. Well, pretty easy to see. The solution to this is x equals plus and minus 2. So then our x-intercepts, or in other words, our roots, will be at negative 2, 0 and 2, 0. So we can go ahead and plot those on the graph. Negative 2, 0 and 2, 0. Now for the y-intercept, we know that we have to evaluate f of 0, so that would be 0 squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds power, and that's just going to be the cube root of negative 4 squared, which is 16. Now you want to think about where cube root of 16 would live, and so you think about the perfect cubes around it. You know that cube root of 16 is going to be in between the cube root of 8 and the cube root of 27, which then means the cube root of 16 is going to live between 2 and 3. So now we can come up on our graph and between 2 and 3 we can plot the y-intercept right here. Okay, now we walk through all the possible asymptotes. So first up, vertical asymptotes. Well, we know that since the domain is all real numbers, it's impossible to have a vertical asymptote, so none, because the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. Horizontal asymptotes, the conditions that have to exist are that the degree of the numerator is less than or equal to the degree of the denominator. Well, we don't even have a denominator, so that can't be true. And we can just say no denominator. Slant asymptote, same reasoning. We don't have a denominator, so the degree of the numerator couldn't possibly be one more than the degree of the denominator when there isn't one. So, same reason. All right, now we need to look for relative extrema. 
And of course to do that we're going to use the first derivative test. So now let's find f prime of x and we can use the power rule and the chain rule so this exponent two-thirds is going to come out front then we have to take x squared minus four and for the exponent we will need to take two-thirds and subtract one two-thirds minus three-thirds is negative one-third and then the chain rule says we have to take that times 2x. Now let's clean that up so we get a rational expression. In the numerator we have 2 times 2x is 4x. In the denominator this 3 will be there and then we have the cube root of x squared minus 4 or we could have written that as the quantity x squared minus 4 to the one-third power. Either way. So now we want to know when this is going to equal 0 or when it does not exist. We can see that it will equal 0 at x equals 0 and we can see that it will not exist at x equals plus and minus 2. So all of these are the critical numbers that have to go on our sine graph for f prime. So we line up, we know this would be 0 and we know that the derivative is 0 there. We know this is negative 1, this is negative 2 and the derivative does not exist there. And then over here at positive 2, same thing, the derivative does not exist there. Now we are ready to do our sine analysis. We pick a test point in this region of negative 3 and the numerator would be negative. If we put a negative 3 in the denominator it will square to become positive 9 minus 4. Now this is going to be positive. So we have a negative over a positive is a negative meaning the function is decreasing. A test point here would be negative 1 so we would have a negative in the top in the bottom, negative 1 squared becomes 1 and when I subtract 4 that turns negative which is okay because remember this is a cube root. Any odd root can have a negative argument. So we have a negative over a negative is a positive which means the function is increasing. Here a test point of 1 yields a positive over a negative which is negative so f is decreasing. Here a test point is 3 positive over positive is a positive the function is increasing. Now we use the first derivative test because the first derivative changes over from negative to positive at x equals negative 2 that is going to be a min. And when the first derivative changes over from positive to negative, that's going to be a max. And when the first derivative changes over from negative to positive at 2, that will be another min. So we will need to evaluate these points. Oh, and actually we already have we know all these values because we already have the y value at negative 2, the y value at positive 2, and the y value at 0. 
So now we can just go ahead and list them and we can say that there will be a relative min at negative two zero and two zero and there will be a relative max at zero cube root of sixteen. All right, so we know those now. Next up, we have to find the points of inflection and the concavity, so we're going to need the second derivative. Now for the second derivative, we're going to have to use the quotient rule on the first derivative. So f double prime of x, f prime is 4, we take that times g, which I'm going to write as 3 times x squared minus 4 to the 1 -third. I know that writing expressions with a fractional exponent will make it easier to factor later. That's why I'm doing it. Then we have to subtract f, which is 4x, times g prime. So we've got 3 times, now g prime is going to be 1 third times x squared minus 4 to the negative 2 thirds, chain rule says times 2x. And then, and then we have to take the entire denominator of 3 times x squared minus 4 to the 1 third and square it. Now let's clean this up. For this first term, the coefficient is a 12, and we've got x squared minus 4 to the 1 third power. Now over here, it's going to be minus, the coefficient is 4 times 2, which is 8, because remember this 3 and the 1 third cancel each other. Then we have an x times an x, so that's an x squared, and then we have x squared minus 4 to the negative 2 thirds. In the denominator, 3 squared is 9, and then we have x squared minus 4, a power of one-third squared becomes a power of two-thirds because you multiply when you have a power to a power. Now we can factor out, we can factor out a four and an x squared minus four to the negative two-thirds from this first term, we would have left 3 times the quantity x squared minus 4. From this second term, we would have minus 2x squared, because this quantity here is already factored out front. And then in the denominator, we have 9x squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds. Now let's clean that up. And we get the 4 remains in the numerator. We have 3x squared minus 2x squared, so that's x squared. Then we have 3 times a negative 4 minus 12, and then in the denominator, 9 times the quantity 
x squared minus 4 to the 4 thirds power. Because remember we had to do 2 thirds from the denominator minus a negative 2 thirds in the numerator so that becomes 2 thirds plus 2 thirds which is 4 thirds. Now we have to solve when that is either 0 or does not exist and it will equal 0 at x equals plus or minus radical 12 which is plus or minus 2 rad 3 and then it will be undefined at x equals plus and minus 2 and we already know that those are relative extrema. So now let's take this information and put it on our sine graph for f double prime. We know that radical 12 is going to live between radical 9 and radical 16 which means 2 rad 3 is going to live between 3 and 4. So we come up to our graph here between 3 and 4 we are going to put 2 rad 3 which is the same as radical 12 so same thing over here in the negative direction between negative 3 and negative 4 we're going to put negative 2 rad 3 we also have to put on plus and minus 2 and line those up So a test point in this region, easy to see, would be negative 4. If we put negative 4 into the numerator, that x squared becomes 16, and then we subtract 12, so that's positive. The denominator is always going to be positive because it's being raised to the fourth power. So I'm not even going to bother to plug my test points in there. We just need to plug into the numerator. So we know already this was a positive, which means the graph is concave up. Now a test point between negative 2 rad 3 and negative 2 is going to be negative 3. That falls into that region. If we put negative 3 into the numerator, the x squared turns it into 9, and 9 minus 12 is negative so it will be concave down there. Our favorite test point is right here, 0, and 0 squared minus 12 is negative, so that's also concave down. And so remember, the signs won't always change in the different regions. You just have to plug it into the second derivative and find out what you have. Now here, in this region, the test point would be 3, and if we plug 3 into our second derivative, we get 9 minus 12, which is negative, so that's also concave down. And then a test point over here would be 4. If we plug 4 into the second derivative, we get 16 minus 12, which is positive. So this will be concave up. So now let's make our conclusions. We know that right at negative 2 rad 3 the second derivative was 0. At negative 2 the second derivative did not exist. At 2 it was a DNE and at 2 rad 3 it was 0. Now looking at this, when the second derivative changes over from positive to negative, we know that that will happen at a point of inflection. Here, 
we already know that this is going to be a minimum so it's impossible for it to be a point of inflection and looking at the signs we would never get a point of inflection from that the only other place we will get a point of inflection is over here at 2 radical 3 because the second derivative changes sign from negative to positive. So that means we have two points of inflection and we need to get the y values for those. So let's do that here. We are going to need f of negative 2 radical 3 so that means we have to do negative 2 radical 3 squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds power. Well, let's see what we're going to get here. We've got negative 2 squared is 4 times 3, so that's going to be 12. 12 minus 4 is 8. So we have 8 to the 2 thirds. The cube root of 8 is 2. 2 squared is 4. So we know that there is a point of inflection at negative 2 rad 3 comma 4. That's one of our points of inflection. Let's go ahead and get that on the graph. We know negative 2 rad 3 was right about there and we go up to a y value of 4 and we can plot this point right here and we know that that is going to be a point of inflection so this was negative 2 rad 3 right here. We also know we will have a point of inflection at positive 2 rad 3. So now we need to figure out that y value. So f of positive 2 rad 3 is going to be 2 rad 3 squared minus 4 to the 2 thirds power and you see you'll get 4 times 3 is 12 12 minus 4 is 8 we have 8 to the 2 thirds power the cube root of 8 is 2 2 squared is 4 so we have another point of inflection at 2 radical 3 comma 4. So let's go ahead up onto the graph and plot that point. At 2 radical 3 we go up to 4 and we will have another point of inflection. Remember we already discovered that negative 2 0 is going to be a min and so is 2 0 and we had a max at the y-intercept here so now we have to figure out how all these points are going to get connected and what will help us do that is the combo graph So now for the combo graph, any x value that appears on either of the f prime or f double prime sign charts comes on down. So we have negative 2 radical 3, which we know is a point of inflection. We have negative 2, which we already know is a min. We have 0 which is a max. We have x equals 2, which is a min. And we have 2 rad 3, which is a point of inflection.
now we can analyze the graph. In this region, from negative infinity until negative 2 radical 3, the graph will be decreasing and concave up. So that has to look like this. So now we can take that and put that on our graph, and that would have to look like this, decreasing and concave up as it heads into that first point of inflection. Now, between the point of inflection and the min here, at negative 2 rad 3 to negative 2, the graph is decreasing and concave down. So we know that has to look like this, decreasing and concave down. So from the point of inflection to the min, we draw a curve that looks like this. From that point of inflection to the min, it looks like that, decreasing and concave down. From negative 2 until 0, the graph is increasing and concave down. So that's going to have to look like this for that section. So now let's translate that up to the graph. So from the minimum to the maximum, it needs to look like this. And now you can see what's happening at negative 2 is a sharp turn. And that's what makes sense because the derivative was undefined. Remember, at a sharp turn, f prime of x at that sharp turn is undefined. That's what helped us know this was going to be a sharp turn. Continuing on, from 0 until 2, the graph will be decreasing and concave down. So decreasing and concave down has to look like that. And if we translate that up to our graph, from the max to the min, we have to draw a curve that looks like this. So from the max to the min, we draw decreasing and concave down. And this maximum makes sense with our derivative sine graph because the derivative is 0 at x equals 0, we expect to have a horizontal tangent line there, right here. So that makes sense. Now, from 2 until 2 rad 3, the graph is increasing and concave down, which means it's going to look like this. So from the minimum to the point of inflection, connect those with a curve that is increasing and concave down. So we do that, increasing and concave down from the minimum to the point of inflection. Then from 2 radical 3 on to infinity, the graph will be increasing and concave up. So increasing and concave up has to look like that. So now we take this curve, and from the point of inflection on to x equals infinity, we draw a shape that looks like this. And once again, we expected to get a sharp turn here because we had a minimum where the first derivative was undefined. And so now here, we have a very detailed look at the entire graph. In this example, use the guidelines for graphing to sketch the graph of f of x equals x to the fourth minus 6x squared. It's time to check your understanding, so pause the video, try this one on your own, and restart when you're ready to check your answer.
So using the guidelines, we know first up we have to determine the domain. Since f of x is a polynomial, we know that the domain is going to be all real numbers. So we can either say that x is in the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity, or we can say that x is an element of the real numbers using the double-stemmed r. Either way. Second, we look for the intercepts. Now we know to get the x-intercepts, we will solve f of x equals 0. So that means we have x to the fourth minus 6x squared has to equal 0. We can factor out an x squared, and we would have left x squared minus 6 is equal to 0. So that means we have x is equal to 0 or plus and minus radical 6. So this gives us our x-intercepts, 0, 0. We've got radical 6, 0. And we've got negative radical 6, 0. And of course, we know that the y-intercept comes from plugging in f of 0. So that means this one is also the y-intercept. So it's an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So let's go ahead and plot those. We've got 0, 0. We have radical 6, 0. Now, radical 6 is going to be between radical 4 and radical 9, which means it's somewhere between 2 and 3. So we come over 1, 2, 3, and we can put it right here. So we've got an x-intercept of rad 6, comma 0, and then the same in the negative direction. We go between negative 2 and negative 3. So this is negative root 6, 0. So we've got the three roots. Next on our guidelines for graphing, we have to find all the vertical, horizontal, or slant asymptotes. Now, because we have a polynomial, we know that it does not have any asymptotes. So polynomial means none. The next step in our guidelines for graphing is to identify any extrema. And we know to do that, we use the first derivative test to find relative extrema. And first we need the critical numbers, so we will set f prime equal to 0 or does not exist and find those x values. So given that f of x is x to the fourth minus 6x squared, we know f prime of x is going to be 4x cubed minus 12x. We can factor out a 4x, and we would have left x squared minus 3. So if we set that to 0 or does not exist, we know that this will equal 0 whenever x is 0 or whenever x is plus and minus radical 3. And we know that this will be undefined exactly never since the derivative is also a polynomial. 
So we do have three critical numbers that we need to plot. So let's go to our sine graph here. We have a critical number at x equals 0, and we know the derivative is 0 there. We have a critical number at positive radical 3, and radical 3 will live between radical 1 and radical 4, so we know it's between 1 and 2. So this is x equals 1, x equals 2, so then x equals radical 3 will be between them. And we know the derivative is 0 there. And let's go ahead and get radical 3 up on the graph as well. We also have a critical number at negative radical 3. So we go negative 1, negative 2, somewhere in between. We plot that negative radical 3. We know the derivative is 0 there. And we'll get negative root 3 on the graph as well. So now we can do test points on all the intervals on the sine graph for f prime. So in this interval, we can pick x equals negative 2. If we put that into the derivative, we would have a negative times a positive is a negative. So we know that f is decreasing there. In this interval, we have a convenient test point of negative 1. So we would have a negative times a negative, and that's going to be a positive which means f will be increasing. In this interval, we have a test point of 1. We would have a positive times a negative is a negative. f is decreasing. And in this interval, we could use a test point of 2 or 3 or 8 million, whatever. And we would have a positive times a positive is a positive. So that means that f is increasing. So now let's apply the first derivative test. Because we have a sign change in the derivative from negative to positive at this critical number, we know there will be a relative minimum there. So we will be plugging in negative root 3 to f of x to find the y value. And we will do that in a minute. Applying the first derivative test here, the derivative changes from a positive to a negative at a critical number. So that's going to be a relative max. Now we already have that point plotted. So we know that the point 0, 0 is going to be a max. And applying the first derivative test here, the derivative changes from negative to positive at a critical number, so that's going to be a relative min. And to find that value, we will need to plug in and find out f of rad 3. So let's go ahead and we'll plug in those values to get the coordinates of those points. So if we find f of negative root 3, we'll need to do negative radical 3 to the fourth minus 6 times negative radical 3 squared. And of course, that's going to be 9 minus 6 times 3, which is 18. So this is negative 9. If we put in f of positive radical 3, we have to do rad 3 to the fourth minus 6 times rad 3 squared. Easy to see we get the same result. Rad 3 to the fourth is going to be 9. Here we get 3 times 6, which is 18. So this is also negative 9. We know we're going to have a max 
at x equals 0, and remember we already know that f of 0 is 0. So we will have a relative max at 0, 0, and we will have two relative mins at negative radical 3, negative 9, and radical 3, negative 9. So let's get all these plotted on our graph. So now we're ready to plot these mins and maxes. We have to go to negative root 3 and down to negative 9. So maybe we should go by 2's on the y-axis here. So then negative root 3, negative 9 is going to be here. And we know that that has to be a minimum with a horizontal tangent. So we know the shape of the graph is going to have to be a smooth curve right there at the minimum. Now the maximum we know is 0, 0, and that's going to also have a horizontal tangent because of that derivative being 0 there. So we know it's going to look like this there. And then we had another minimum at radical 3, negative 9. And that's going to be a smooth curve as well. So we have a minimum here and here. And we had already labeled the maximum up there. So now the next step in our guidelines for graphing is to identify any points of inflection. So we need to find the second derivative and then make a sine graph. So to get f double prime, we have to take the derivative of f prime. So that's going to be 12x squared minus 12. We can factor out a 12, and we would have x squared minus 1. And of course, we set that to 0 or does not exist. And this is going to equal 0 whenever x is equal to plus and minus 1. And it's going to be undefined never since it's a polynomial. So now we have to make our sine graph for f double prime using these two values on the line graph. So we've got x equals negative 1 and positive 1. Let's get those on the sine graph for f double prime. We know f double prime is 0 there, and it's also 0 at positive 1. Now, in this first interval, we could pick a test point of negative 2. Plugging that into the second derivative, that will be positive, which means f is going to be concave up there. Our favorite test point lives in this interval, 0. Plugging that into the second derivative, it's going to be negative, so f is concave down there. And a test point in this interval would be 2. And plugging that into the second derivative, it will be positive, which means the graph is going to be concave up there. So now, anywhere the second derivative changes from positive to negative at a point on the graph, we know that's going to be a point of inflection. So there's going to be one at negative 1. And there will also be a point of inflection at positive 1 due to the sign change there. So now we need to figure out the coordinates of those points. f of negative 1 is going to be negative 1 to the 4th, 
minus 6 times negative 1 squared. So that's going to be 1 minus 6, which is negative 5, and f of positive 1. We can see, because we have an even function, 1 to the 4th minus 6 times 1 squared, that's going to give us the same thing, which is negative 5. So the graph will have points of inflection at negative 1, negative 5, and at 1, negative 5. So now we can add those to the graph. So at negative 1, negative 5, so we can put the negative 5 on the graph there, we know we're going to have a point of inflection. And at positive 1, negative 5, we will also have a point of inflection. And now we're getting very close to being able to draw the graph. Sometimes it's helpful to make this combo graph. Let's get all the x values on here. We have negative root 3. We have negative 1. We've got 0, positive 1, and radical 3. Now, from negative infinity up until negative root 3, we can see that the graph is decreasing and concave up. So that means it will have to look like this. Then from negative root 3 until negative 1, the graph is increasing and concave up. So it will have to look like this. Between negative 1 and 0, it's increasing and concave down. So it's going to have to look like this. Between 0 and 1, it's going to be decreasing and concave down. So it will have to look like this. Between x equals 1 and x equals radical 3, it's going to be decreasing but concave up. Well, that has to look like this. And then from radical 3 on, it's increasing and concave up. So it will have to look like this. So this gives us the basic shape of the curve. And now we can transfer that up to the graph and connect all the points. So from negative infinity all the way till negative radical 3, it's decreasing and concave up. Then it's increasing and concave up to the point of inflection. And then it's increasing and concave down to the maximum. Then decreasing and concave down to the point of inflection. Decreasing and concave up to the minimum. And then increasing and concave up forever. So now we have a lot of detail about the graph, and that comes from applying the first derivative test on the sine graph of f prime to get the relative mins and maxes, and we get the points of inflection by looking for sine changes on the sine graph of f double prime.